Cognitive scientists of religion have identified a number of features that collaborate to make religion natural, particularly the way we identify intentional agents, the way we reason about minds and bodies, and our tendency to search for purpose in the natural world. Okay, importantly, all our cognitive faculties that are foundational for the way humans make sense of the world and life in it. These aren't add-ons. These aren't expendable. These faculties just are sort of intrinsic to how humans operate. Through numerous experiments, Deb Kellerman at Boston and colleagues have produced considerable evidence that children exercise what she calls promiscuous teleology, a tendency to find design and purpose in the natural world beyond what parents license. For instance, children are inclined to say rocks are pointy, not because of some physical processes, but because being pointy keeps them from being sat upon and crushed. Using theological reasoning to account for the origins or causes of things extends to such living things as plants and animals and non-living things such as rocks and rivers. Okay, and what I've got up here ooh, uh, are just some examples of some questions that she asked children and the kinds of answers that children gave in an open-ended kind of task. She has all kinds of different really clever experiments showing that children have this real strong attraction to what she calls teleofunctional explanations. And interestingly, she's recently produced evidence that adults that have not been formally educated show a similar preference for such explanations, as do scientifically educated adults under conditions of hurried response, including professional scientists. Make them answer quickly. They don't just randomly create errors. They create errors in the direction of errors in the direction of teleological explanations. Okay. These results suggest that promiscuous teleology is not simply outgrown, but it's, only, but it's tamped down under some cultural context. That is, it's natural to favor these teleofunctional kinds of explanations for things. See purpose, see design, see there's, there's a goal to this stuff, and we have to unlearn that, okay, or tamp it down. So, perhaps not surprisingly, this teleological reasoning often finds a comfortable fit with the idea that the purpose was brought about by an intentional agent or creator or creators or the forest spirits or whomever. Okay, we're not necessarily, this doesn't necessarily point toward a cosmic creator, but that there's someone out there who, or some ones who order the natural world in some way. All right. Uh, actually, this is an idea you can find threads of in Piaget from a, about 100 years ago now. The difference is that Piaget thought this led children to think that humans were the ones responsible for the natural world, and more recent research shows they don't go that way. Uh, so then, uh, an important question is, do such explanations explain away religion? And uh, uh, if you can read this, here's a little quote from Jesse Baring's new book. Um, I won't read it for you. Basically, he just is saying, look, it's our theory of mind that gives us the social brain, so that's what uh, generates these ideas in God, and therefore there's no God. It's not an argument, but it's an assertion. Um, it's standing in for a tacit argument, I think. Um, in fact, he ends there with this. It may feel as if there is something grander out there watching, knowing, caring, perhaps even judging, but in fact that's just your overactive theory of mind. In reality, there is only the air you breathe. Um, and many new atheists drawing upon cognitive science of religion to attack religious beliefs seem to be committing, well, I think what they're committing is a version of the genetic fallacy that William James warned against at the start of his varieties of religious experience. So here's what James said. Um, the, the backdrop of this is James is noting that from methodological naturalism, all mental states have biopsychological cause all of them, and identifying it says nothing one way or the other about whether they're good or useful or true. All right. So according to the general postulate of psychology you just referred to, there's not a single one of our states of mind, high or low, healthy or morbid, that ha has not some organic process as its condition, or we might say an evolutionary background for it. Scientific theories are organically conditioned just as much as religious emotions are, and if we only knew the facts intimately enough, we should doubtlessly see the liver determining the dicta of the sturdy atheist as decisively as it does those of the Methodists under conviction anxious about his soul. When it alters us in one way, the blood that percolates it, we get the Methodists. When in another way, we get the atheist form of mind, James says. For cognitive and evolutionary 
explanations of religion to bear upon whether one ought to believe, they need to do more than explain that the brain or evolution or cognition was involved with such belief. That just isn't new information, right? We all suspected that. Pointing out that these scientific findings imply that people would have religious beliefs whether or not they weren't tr were true won't do the job either. And uh, I think this first, it's far from obvious to me at least, that this claim is an implication of the science at all. It could be that religious beliefs are a byproduct of evolved cognition only because of divine mind behind the natural order. And if there was no such god or gods or whatever it is, our minds and beliefs would be very different. We just don't know. Uh, second, a huge number of natural beliefs would be undercut by the same kind of logic. We appear to have a natural, evolved disposition to regard others as having minds, causation to be unidirectional and real, color to be a real quality of objects, and so on. Arguably, we would and sometimes do believe such things whether or not they were true. If so, should we jettison such beliefs as well? And maybe, I mean, some cognitive scientists argue, yes, we should. Um, but if we do, will we have enough pre-scientific commitments available to get the scientific enterprise that allegedly undercut such commitments off the ground? So I'll leave it to the uh, philosophers of science to worry about that one, but I suspect not is the answer. So arguments from the naturalness of religion against religion need to show that the psychological antecedents are untrustworthy or otherwise suspect in their belief-forming activities, not just that they are. It's just pointing that they exist, not enough. You need to show that they're suspect or untrustworthy, and it isn't clear that one can do this without already taking some stand on the quality of their products. Consider a household scale. I might suspect that it gives a bad reading for any number of reasons, but I can't determine that it's in fact error prone without independently determining the weight of an object and then showing that the scale does not give its true weight. Just dropping a bag of potatoes on the scale saying, see, the scale says 10 kilos. That's not right. This scale is no good would only be convincing if we already knew that the sack of potatoes does not, in fact, weigh 10 kilos. If our cognitive systems weigh our experiences and conclude that, conclude that there's at least one God out there, we can't take this conclusion as evidence that the cognitive systems are mistaken unless we have independent reason to think that there are no gods. That's be question begging, right? Indeed, normally we would regard such a weighing as evidence that there is at least one God. So it seems to me then that the best the anti-religionist is left with building a case from world is would be building a case from worldview coherence. I think that's that's the way to go. Um, that is arguing that these particular findings from the cognitive and evolutionary sciences are more at home with a materialist worldview than a religious one. Uh, building such a successful argument might be possible, but I think it faces at least a couple of formidable challenges. Most difficult might be the problem that the naturalness of religion seems to be unwritten by underwritten by the same cognitive systems that gives us a host of mundane commitments, such as the existence of other conscious minds, orderly intelligibility of the natural world, predictable causation, that are required for most materialist worldviews as well as religious ones. So be careful of collateral damage.